Greetings to everyone who's listening. At least as far as new recordings go, you haven't heard my voice for about 10 months. And I'd like to just get right into the topic that provoked me to make a new recording. So first, let's just start with the question for introduction of what does it mean to baptize yourself in the name of Jesus? And one interpretation I like to use is that it has to do with being immersed into the story as the character. So when you're reading any narrative or watching any movie, you can become that character. And hopefully there's some amount of experience anyone listening has in reading a book or watching a movie and feeling as though you are the character in the story. So when somebody betrays that character, you feel betrayed. When that character gets angry, you feel that anger. When that character grieves the loss of a loved one, you grieve that loss as though it's your own loved one. It's a total immersion into a story which allows you to experience those things as though those were your experiences and not those of the one in the story. To me, that's what it is. There's an instruction in the story saying, baptize yourself in the name of Jesus. It's saying, okay, use this principle put yourself in the story and here's where to put yourself in the story so when you do that it becomes your story and that's one of the perspectives that I use when approaching the gospel accounts is that I intend from the start to baptize myself in the name of Jesus. And this means that whatever happens to him is about me. And whatever he says, when it's something that he's speaking for himself, is about me. And you can even go to that passage in 1 John, that as he is, so are we in this world. It's another way of expressing it. There are many forms of expressing this, and some say, for example, that his death was our death and his resurrection was our resurrection. These are all following the same principle that you are baptized in the story as the character of the story, as the hero of the story. And so when you put yourself in that place and you think about things, you start to think, well, how is this actually about my life or my own experience? As well as the fact that by just in, in general, by being able to experience things, immersing yourself in a story, it can help you to gain new perspectives. It can give you experiences that you don't have it can help you build empathy with somebody that's had an experience that you'll that you haven't had or may never have and so you might be able to go oh now i understand what that is probably like not having actually experienced it but having experienced it vicariously by immersing myself in this story it's one of the reasons that it's so important to have meaningful stories and stories that are composed and, and directed in such a way that you are able to immerse yourself in them. Honestly, it's one of the reasons why we think so highly as a society of people who act out parts and stories.
because they're able to do that in a way that is so compelling that we become part of the story. And it's really what the whole point of there being a story is. So, anyway, I'm thinking about how the just a perspective on the crucifixion and what happened at the cross. And I was thinking about that and saying, like, there's something about this where there's the death of a god and the death of an old god, a false god, a dead god, which then becomes the foundation and the birth of a better principle, a better God, a better notion of God. Because all notions of God are God, and yet they're merely notions. They are not the God itself. They're just ideas that we have, and sometimes those ideas are helpful and sometimes they're not. So, this is obviously going to go along with my own version of things, my own interpretations, my own experiences with life, of the way I'm going to present and see this. And I would even say that I've, in a sense, I've invented my own version of the story. But I think that's actually what we're supposed to do. And so one of the things I want to start with is to demonstrate that nobody really has a pure version of the story. Because there's actually, even just in within the biblical canon, there are four different stories. And those stories have been harmonized into a singular story. I don't think that's wrong. In fact, I, I like that idea. I like the idea of taking a singular story, or actually separate stories, rather, and turning them into a singular story and harmonizing them in certain ways. But they're actually different stories. And so... There's one in Matthew, one in Mark, one in Luke, and one in John. And there are certain things that are different about those stories, one from another. And so, that's traditionally taught as four different historical recaps of something that happened with different focuses and a certain amount of remembering things different. But my view is that there are four different tellings of a story. And so it's the same story, but there's a difference. And the reason, if I were to tell you a story and change it, there's a reason why I'm changing it. And so the change is important. And so it's important to understand that what whatever is different about the story from one to another is what that composer thought was of importance. I don't tell a story and change something arbitrarily. If I'm changing it, it's because I'm going, okay, there's something about this other version that doesn't suit what I want here. So, that's an important thing to, to think about when there's a difference from one story to the next. The difference is one of the main points being made, or it's at least an important, it's an important distinction. There's, there's a reason that it's different. So with that said, it's not a problem to therefore take the story and whether you're harmonizing it or you're changing something, this is what was being done in the first place. There's a community to be served. There's a purpose for the story. There's a reason why 
this is being passed on from one person to the next. And a difference in the way it's told or a difference in the focus of the story or any kind of thing that's different is part of the point. It's why it's being told that way. So there's actually four different stories. And I don't want to be too uh, weighed down by what's different from one to another because I actually like the harmonized story. Um, but I just want to, I want to point out that the harmonized story that most people are familiar with doesn't exist anywhere in antiquity. Um, at least in terms of when these New Testament writings were written, there's not a harmonized account. I know there is, there's one that's several hundred years old, and certainly modern attempts at stringing these together in a in a coherent and harmonized fashion, especially including movies that have been made popular. But, for example, um, it's only in Luke that Jesus says, Father, forgive them. And it's only in John where he says, is it, is, it is finished. So just taking that by itself, if you have... A Jesus who on the cross said, Father, forgive them, and also said, it is finished. You've harmonized two accounts that don't include those together. So it's already a hybrid story. So I just want to go through a couple things here. And I need to switch what I'm looking at. So here we go. So if we look at why have you forsaken me, we can see that this is in Matthew 27, 46 and Mark 15, 34, where he says, uh, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So it's not in Luke or, or in John that he says that. Um, in Matthew, Mark and John, there's a sign that says, or they, they say, call him king of Israel. So that doesn't appear in Luke. If you have a Jesus who is in the Garden of Gethsemane and sweating great drops of blood, he only had great drops of blood according to the Luke account. And interestingly enough, Gethsemane is only mentioned in Matthew and Mark. And in Luke, it actually says that he went to the Mount of Olives. So if we look here, it says, and he came out and he went as he was to the Mount of Olives. It's only referred to as Gethsemane in Matthew and Mark. And then we have differences as to I'm not looking at the right thing here. I need to find where it says, here we go. So here's an interesting difference in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And for some reason, 1 Corinthians, you have Jesus who mentions my blood of the New Testament. And this is a well-known scene. But in John, the only time he mentions my blood is here in a confrontation. It's a confrontational uh, passage as opposed to uh, there's one of fellowship in the, in the other counts where he speaks of his blood shed for you. And this is my body and this is my blood. In John, it's a confrontation. Whoso eats my fe flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. Um, and he says, you know, it's a very confrontational passage in John 6, a very long chapter as well, relatively speaking. Um, so it's a completely different context that he mentions eating his blood and, or drinking his blood and eating his, his body in John than it is in the other three Gospels. 
and then so one of the things I wanted to get to here ooh before that cuz this is related to my blood and Gethsemane so here we have that in some of the accounts he's got this cup is the is the new testament in my blood but in Gethsemane he's he's praying you know let this cup pass from me that's in Matthew in uh in Mark he says take away this cup from me in Luke he says remove this cup from me and then nothing in John so John has no account of him saying you know uh, of him praying don't don't make this have to happen so now we get to who he's crucified with and this is pretty unified although a little bit different language but he's got two thieves in Matthew he's got two thieves in Mark he's got two malefactors in Luke but then neither of them is in John again another strange difference that in these accounts the the synoptics and John are quite different what's interesting though is is so many of the things that are kind of iconic about the crucifixion are absent from John because in John he doesn't say father forgive them in John he doesn't say he doesn't uh uh, what am I saying? He doesn't... I forgot my tra train of thought now. He doesn't... Uh, most of the things that we think about in terms of what happened at the crucifixion aren't part of the narrative in John. So let me get to that. I should have prepared this better. So he's got the sign, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews... And they have, uh, uh, his coat was without seam. They, they rent it and cast lots that the scripture might be fulfilled. Um, and then he says uh, the, the bit with his mother, woman, behold your son. To the disciple, behold your mother. And he says, all things are uh, now accomplished that the scripture might be fulfilled. He said, I thirst. They gave him vinegar, um, put it on his up, put it to his mouth, and he received the vinegar and said, it is finished, bowed his head and gave up the ghost. There it is. That's that's the whole entire series of things that tells you that happened at the cross. And there's a lot of things that are kind of traditionally and iconically thought of in terms of that that day, which are not in the John account. Um, but this is this is where it is finished is. So that's the only place where it is finished. Uh, none of the other accounts have it being it is finished. And if we go just to that part, uh, he's he's being mocked. Let's see let's see whether Elias will come and save him. And he cried again with a loud voice and yielded up the ghost. And then there's the the veil was rent, which is uh, common in the synoptics. Here he, uh, in Mark, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Behold, he calls Elias. They, they misunderstood. Let's see if Elias will come and take him down. Uh, he cried with a loud voice and gave up the ghost, and the veil of the temple was rent in two from bottom to top, top to bottom. And then in Luke, you have, uh, you have uh, darkness. There was sun of the darkness. The temple was rent. Uh, in, uh, he says, "Father, into my hand, into your hands, I commend your spirit." And he gave up the ghost. But this is the one where, if you back up, you have Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And that is the only place it appears. So that's that's just that portion of what happened at the cross. So. Again, I don't want to focus on what's different so much as I want to point out that the common interpretation in terms of whatever story there is at the cross is actually one that's invented. It's, it's a harmonized invention that isn't written anywhere in antiquity or 
within the, the confines of what's in the biblical canon. So it's already established that we kind of tell our own version of the story and have come up with a, with a new version based on combining these narratives and, and saying like, okay, well, we have a narrative in which all these things happened and we, we say, okay, this one tell, talks about this, this one talks about that, and put them all together. But that's really just an interpretation. I'm all for that. I, I'm not by any means putting that down as a way to do. I think that's actually what... I, I believe that a retelling of the story, an updating of it, a revising of it, a, a taking of a part and going, you know what, that really just doesn't work for me. This part needs to be a little bit different is something that is necessary and actually part of what is supposed to be getting done here in the telling of the stories. So now I just kind of want to focus on the Luke account because this is where if you go back, he's sweating great drops of blood praying let this cup pass from me. And so at that point, what is he doing? He's, he's praying to a God who intervenes. He's praying to a God that, that alters reality and changes things. And this is part of, the idea, you know, the, the prayer of the righteous avails much. And, you know, God hears the cries of the desperate or the, you know. And so here he is. He, he came out in the Mount of Olives and he was at the place. He said, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And it says there appeared an angel from heaven strengthening him. So that's interesting because in this account, uh, He's, he's not given really what he asked for. But what he's given is an ability to endure what is to come. Which is something to ponder on. That those moments where when you're, you're praying for a change in circumstances, really what you need is, is the wisdom or the strength or the support to get through whatever it is because it's not going to change. It's going to be what it is. And yet, even being strengthened in an agony, he prayed more earnestly and his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And when he rose up from prayer, he was come to his disciples, found sleeping in sorrow, and said, Why do you sleep? Rise and pray. So then he's betrayed. Judas shows up the, the, in all this. And we move on, and, and we get to being crucified. So we'll jump to that. And we see that uh, in the Luke account, it says there were also two other malefactors, which is the opposite of a benefactor. A benefactor is someone who does you well. A malefactor comes from the opposite in terms of its, its root usage. Led with him to be put to death. And when they were come to the place, which is called Calvary, uh, there, there they crucified him, and the malefactors, one on the right hand, on the other on the left. So now we're going to get to where I kind of have my own interpretation. Thinking like, okay, what is this? How is this about me? I've baptized myself in the name of Jesus. I've recognized that I'm about to face something that I don't want to face. Something is approaching and impending and looming and I'm crying out to a God who hears, my, hears cries and intervenes and changes things and alters those circumstances and said, 
please don't make this have to happen. To the point of, of extreme sweating blood, just in absolute grief, despair, turmoil, tumult over it. And the only thing that I've received is some strength. And even recognizing that, I say, please, please don't make this have to happen. I, I can't face this. I don't want to do this. And so what is my only concept in this, this particular image of God is that God must have some kind of will for me or some kind of plan or some kind of reason why this can't be changed. Why won't God change it? Why, why is my prayer not being answered? Why can't I escape this destiny that I don't want to face? And so, what if it turns out that that's a God who doesn't exist, or at least that image of God isn't accurate? Maybe it's not even helpful. Maybe that's a dead God. Or maybe that's a God of not being able to cope with life. Maybe that's a God who isn't going to answer that prayer. So what about that? It's only in Matthew and Mark where he says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But here I am. I'm going to harmonize that right into this Luke account. And I'm going to say, They were come to a place which was called Calvary. There they crucified him, and the malefactors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. And here it is at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is being interpreted, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some that stood by when they heard it said, Behold, he calls on Elias. And when one ran up with a sponge full of vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him to drink, saying, Let alone, let us see whether Elias will come to take him down. But here they are, they're ridiculing him. They're saying, your God doesn't seem to be doing much for you. And here it says, and the rulers also with them derided him, saying, he saved others, let him save himself if he be Christ of the chosen God. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming to him, offering him vinegar, and saying, if you be the son of the, uh, the king of the Jews, save yourself. And a superscription also was written over him in letters of Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. And here you have the two that were hanged with him. One of the malefactors which was hanged railed on him, saying, If you be Christ, save yourself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, seeing that you are in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing amiss. And he says unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto you, Today you shall be with me in paradise. And this was about the sixth hour, and there was a darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. And the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was rent in the midst. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. So when I put myself in this story, I think that these two thieves being hung with him are two notions of God. And God 
is always our own creation. Not that there isn't something that one could call God that transcends your own notion of such. But all we have is our own notions of such. Every God we have is something held within our own minds and our own way of seeing it. So here he is. What is he being hung with? Are his notions of God. And one is the one which needs to die. And one is the one which will be reborn. One is the one that will bring new life and one is the one which makes accusation so the one says save yourself and us it's a god of accusation it's the god that didn't hear when he says let this cup pass from me what does he do instead? Oh, you know, why don't you do it? You think you're so great. But what does the other one do? It says, he's done nothing wrong. Why would you accuse? One is the God within that is the true or truer notion of God. the one that we all carry with us that is the one that accepts, the one that defends, the one that provides, the one that sees, the one that has compassion. And so that one even says, our condemnation is just. After all, we're God. It's all our fault, everything that's happened. But this man has done nothing amiss. He's just a man. And so he says to him, because Jesus is in despair, having been forsaken by the God who didn't answer the prayer, who didn't take that cup away from him, the one that's letting him die there. But that psalm continues the one that was quoted. And it says that I've never left you. Why? Because God is Emmanuel, with us, within us, as us. And so he says to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. So here's my twist on it. Because this is often characterized as somebody sort of pleading out let me be in uh let me be allowed into your kingdom when you come to reign but i have this as emmanuel god within us saying hey guy remember me remember that the kingdom is within remember that god is within you as you remember that you have the mind of christ And when you remember that, today you will be with me in paradise. So let's look at this. And he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Which could actually really be, remember me so that you can come into your kingdom. And here's interesting. This is an interpretation. Well, this instance of Jesus is in the Greek text. This one is not. So let's get rid of the interpretation. And what do we have when we get rid of the interpretation? He said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom and said unto him, Verily I say unto you, Today you shall be with me in paradise.
chew on that for a second. The one within him, the God within him, Emmanuel, says, remember me? And when you do, you'll come into your kingdom. And right here, right now, dying, suffocating to death. In what just a moment ago was grief and despair. I tell you, when you remember that, today, right here, right now, you will be in paradise. So that's my own version of the story. In my own version of the story, God so loved the world that he gave it her uniquely beloved child, which is you, which is me. And whosoever believes himself to be that uniquely beloved shall not waste in grief, accusation, and despair, but shall prosper in joy, peace, and abundant life.